Good afternoon. Welcome to St Ninian's. My name's Stuart, for those of you who don't know me, and I get to be the minister here. And it was my privilege to be Dixon's minister too. We meet here today to give thanks for Dixon, who's gone before us, and to God's eternal light. And while we're glad for him, we feel the sadness of that parting. And our loving sympathy goes to Joan and to all the family. Death is always a mystery. Whenever it comes, it's never an end, but always a beginning. We know this because Jesus went down into the darkness of death and came back from it like the sun in full strength. The death and resurrection of Jesus lead to the glory of the morning. So we follow him through the door of death into a life of perfection and of peace, the life of God itself. So let's worship God. God, let it, God, God, Dixon. <laughs> Same thing. Or at least very similar, only, yeah. Dixon left instructions. Some of them were what we should sing. Some of them were what we should say. But the one that was underlined was, to the minister, instruct the congregation to sing with gusto. You have been duly instructed, and if you don't, I will stop and we'll start again. <laughs> and I mean it. <laughs> the king of love, my shepherd is. <laughs> To be honest, I think you can do better than that. <laughs> You'll have one more go. Let's join together in prayer. <coughs> Lord of life and conqueror of death, you are our help in every time of trouble. In the presence of death, you comfort those who mourn. So we bow before you today, believing you bear our grief and share our sense of loss. Give us the grace to worship you and to trust in your goodness and your mercy. Assure us that because Christ lives, we shall also live through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Loving God, in our pain, we remember with sorrow how we failed one another 
and grieved your heart and your kindness forgive our past sins and set us free from any guilt and make us strong to live our lives in love God of grace and power send your Holy Spirit among us that we might hear your promises and know them to be true and so receiving the comfort and peace that they bring through our Lord Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever Amen Lord to whom shall we go your words are the words of eternal life we read from Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul he leads me in right paths for his name's sake even though I walk in the darkest valley I fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever these are some of the most famous words in the Bible Psalm 23 we've just sung it and now we've heard it read these are the psalms that we turn to in times of difficulty times of crisis and of loss but they're also psalms for every day of our lives the Lord is my shepherd he makes me lie down in green pastures and so it goes on all that we've been given has been provided by God he keeps us and he looks after us but the psalm reminds us that even in our darkest moments as we walk in the shadow of the valley of death that God is there with us in the psalmist's time, the time of King David, the valley of death was a real place. It still is. Just between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives is a cemetery in the Kidron Valley. And it's where people for centuries and centuries have been buried. The whole valley is a graveyard. It's been there for over 3,000 years. And so to get from one side to the other, you quite literally had to walk through the valley of death. And it was a dangerous place because robbers would hide there waiting for unsuspecting travellers to steal from. Of course, the psalm is a poem, a song. It's not just for a situation 3,000 years ago when people were scared to walk down a path. It's for us here and now, as we walk in that same valley under the shadow of grief and loss, God will be with us, protecting us, comforting us. But that's not where the psalm ends. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Even when things are hard, we can look around and we can give thanks for the people who surround us, the food on our table, the clothes on our backs. We can see a world of blessing when we open our eyes to all that God has created each and every day. All of it an endless procession of miracles. Apparently Einstein once said there are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. The psalm reminds us what Dixon always knew. That everything, all of it, is miraculous. That God is in all of it with us. So that promise that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever is true for him. Actually, it should be more like goodness and mercy will pursue me, chase me, never let me go. And John's Gospel puts it another way. For God loved the world so much, so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. This is a promise that Dixon is now part of and we can give thanks for that. Give thanks for his life. Give thanks for all that he leaves us and the confidence that he had in that faith. I'm going to ask David to come and read us a poem. He looked surprised there, he was a bit worried. Wow. 
wreck in the place. <laughs> Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I've only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I and you are you. And the old life that we lived so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were together, to each other, we are still. Call me by the old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no for forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we have always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without an effort, without the ghost of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is this death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I'm out of sight? I am but waiting for you, for an interval, somewhere near, just around the corner. All is well, nothing is hurt, nothing is lost. One brief moment and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. Dixon very helpfully, and you should all do this, wrote down his life story to help with this moment. I'm glad he did, but at the same time, I wish he'd showed me it beforehand so I could ask him why on earth he thought that in 2008 he changed his Kia Sportage for a magenta. <laughs> Who cares? <coughs> anyway, the following is a collection of other things that Dixon thought were important enough to write down. I've edited it slightly because the Buffy's booked for half past one and he left instructions that that should happen too and I'm not going to argue with that. Dixon made his first of many appearances on the Monday the 20th of November 1939. Apparently there were some other significant world events that year. Batman appeared for the first time. The Wizard of Oz was released in the cinema and World War II began. It was because of the last one that Dixon was born in Milken Park Nursing Home in Loch Winnock in Renfrewshire, his mother having been sent out to the country because of the bombing. His parents, William and Margaret, lived at 1955, that's right, 1955 Mary Hill Road in Glasgow. And at the age of three, he moved just round the corner to 1 Celtic Street. And at the time, Celtic Street was the shortest street in Glasgow. And he remained there until he left to get married in 1965. I think he went outside. He didn't stay in the house <laughs> all of that time. His father had poor health and worked periodically as a better wear, br better wear brush salesman. That's hard to say. Dixon records that his dad was a very intelligent man and spoke five languages. So, he could speak five languages. I can't speak English. He spoke some of them fluently but he was frustrated at his poor job prospects because of his health. My mother, says Dixon, was formerly in domestic service and of lesser intelligence than my father. <laughs> she had left, left school in her teens, so there. His paternal grandparents, William and Anne, lived in the same building as them, so Dixon was very close to them, quite literally up the close. And next door. He never met his maternal grandparents because both of them had died before he was born. At the age of five, Dixon went to Mary Hill Public School. That's Gilshock Hill. Gilshock Hill. Where he, uh, when he was seven, just a small boy, Dixon found his father dead in his bed. He died of kidney failure following a lengthy illness. And it was a a moment that had a profound effect on Dixon, I think. He says, as far as he can remember, his mother took a job in the school meal service shortly after his father's death, and she worked in the education service in several capacities till her retirement in 1974. 
1949, his grandfather died, leaving him at just nine, the sole male in the Gemmell family, apart from some great uncles. And he says that he felt, particularly in his teens, a great responsibility for his mother and his grandmother. From the age of 12, he was educated at North Kelvin Side Senior Secondary School, but he left school without gaining any qualifications in 1956. In April of that year, Dixon passed the entrance exam for the Glasgow Corporation and he began his local government career on the 1st of August 1956. His lack of academic qualifications would later be down, he says, to the absence of adequate support and encouragement from his mother and grandmother, neither of whom had the education or knowledge that his father could have given him had he lived. However, in hindsight, he reflects it might have been his own laziness that was a significant factor. <laughs> His first job was a general clerical offer in the city engineers department. It was situated in an office on the third floor of Glasgow City Chambers, where he worked for the next 12 years. He dealt with the wages of the highways and sewage department employees and latterly was the admin officer for the master of works inspectors, of which there were 40. In 1968, Dixon transferred to the City Housing Department, where he did numerous jobs in various parts of the City of Glasgow, including a housing supervisor, an arrears officer, and an assistant housing manager, and even, again, the departmental salaries officer. He worked in the East End, he worked in Drumchapel, and in the City Centre, and finally in Canvas Lang and Rutherglen. In 1991, at the age of 52, following a stress-related period of work, Dixon took an early retirement package after 35 years of service. He then worked part-time for four years for a housing cooperative in Barlanark and left before again because of stress, having had a heart bypass in 1996. We'll come back to that in a minute. His final job was as a clean easy agent. He took the job so that he could get plenty of walking exercise following said triple bypass. But John was telling me the other day that on a Friday when he got paid they had a chippy. <laughs> He finally threw in the towel, pun intended. Cleaning it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. In 1998, to become a house husband. But there was more to his life than work. When he was just nine years old, Dixon joined the Life Boys, which then became the Boys Brigade Junior Section in Mary Hill Old Parish Church. And he was connected with the Boys Brigade ever since, as a boy, as a non-commissioned officer, as an officer, and as a company captain in the 152nd Glasgow Company. He joined the church at age 16, and as he had not been christened, his baptism occurred on the same day. That involvement in the church has continued throughout the whole of his life. He sung in church choirs, acted in drama groups, played the drums in the BB and in a pipe band and was even the drum major for a while. Dixon was also president of the Youth Fellowship, of course he was, and eventually became a member of the Congregational Board. Having been persuaded by a workmate and best friend Ian MacDonald to assist with MC duties, persuaded, mm. how much do you think you had to ask? To assist with MC duties at the Highlanders Institute in Glasgow, it was there that he met Joan Stirling on the 28th of August 1963. Did you tell him that or did he remember? He, remember. he remembered. Good for him. I can't remember what I had for my breakfast. <laughs> After two years of courtship, they were married on the 9th of October 1965 in Maryhill Old Parish Church. And they lived in a three room and kitchen, two up in brackets at 95 Dundrennan Road in Battlefield for three years. Prior to moving to Straven in August 1968, Ian, their first son, was born on the 28th of August 1967. You can work out for yourself how old that makes him. But they had his first birthday in 52 Glasgow Road in Straven. And on the 18th of October 1976, David was born, completing their family. On their arrival in Straven, Dixon quickly became involved with the Rankin Parish Church and then the newly formed Rank and File Drama Group, pun intended. He joined the first Stonehouse Boys Brigade Company as an officer because there was no company in Straven yet. He also played the drums for a short period in the Straven and District Pipe Band. He almost immediately on arrival in Straven also joined the Straven Male Voice Choir and remained a member until 1978, shortly before its demise. And in 1979, he joined the Stonehouse Male Voice Choir and remained a member of that for 27 years, and it's the last six of his time with them as president. 
1979, Dixon got together with some ex-BB officers who were now living in Straven. And guess what? The first Straven Boys Brigade Company was, was started, affiliated to the Straven Churches Council. And once again, Dixon became a BB captain. In time, both Ian and David would follow in his footsteps as boys and officers, David eventually becoming a captain. He obviously... No, no. Sorry. <laughs> Dixon finally gave up the Boys Brigade in 1997, uh, although he can't really leave, it's a bit like the Hotel California. He maintained his interest in the Straven Company and served as a reserve officer in the Hamilton Battalion. His rank in Parish Church connection continued throughout the years that he spent in Straven as a choir member, a board member, and in 1974 he was ordained as an elder. He writes with an exclamation mark at this point, Neither Joan nor the boys retain much of a connection with the church. <laughs> so there. Which isn't it actually true. <coughs> when Ian left home in July 1990 to work in London and then to eventually marry Jane in 1991, Dixon and Joan were left with a house which extended upwards on three floors. So they started to think about moving. This was put on hold when Joan's mum came home from Australia in 1992 to live with them. And in September 1992, while Joan, David, Mum Stirling and Mum Gemmell and Dixon travelled to Essex to visit Ian and Jane, they stopped over at Skibi, Skibi? Skibi Travel Lodge in Cumbria on the way down. In the morning, Dixon discovered that his mother had died in the night. Following Grant Stirling's death in 1995, they started to think seriously about moving to a smaller house and moved to a new build semi bungalow in Stonehouse in December 1996. Joan and later Dixon had joined the executive committee of Abbeyfield Straven Society and moving to Stonehouse retained their positions there, which you don't always get to do. Dixon had also joined a group of musicians called Sounds Scottish. He played Scottish music and he entertained elderly people in guilds and care homes and clubs from 1982. And such was the demand for their entertainment that Joan became the coordinator and managed all their bookings. South Scottish finally ceased in July of 2004, mainly due to the band being older than the elderly people <laughs> in the guilds and the care homes and the clubs. In 1996, Dixon discovered that he needed a triple bypass operation. He only discovered that because a test showed his cholesterol was high and they went in to check out why that may be the case. He thankfully made a good recovery. Dixon writes that he counts himself fortunate that both of his sons ended up with good jobs. Ian as a police officer and David as an I... Oh, this has stopped. Oh, no. David is an IT consultant, see, there you go, an IT contractor, both, it's fairly, well, sorry, it's fair to say, David's IT skills obviously didn't come from his father. <laughs> in late 1999, Ian, Jane and the family moved from London to Kirkcaldy in Fife, when Ian transferred from the Met to Fife Constabulary. Being merely an hour away from their three grandchildren, Dixon and Joan were looking forward to feeling and acting as real grandparents, that's what he wrote. That was until returning on their last visit to London. They loaded up some of Ian and Jane's belongings and prior to their move, and Joan slipped, coming out of the little chef. She broke her leg and ended up in crutches for a month. It seems that visiting Ian and Jane is potentially hazardous. <laughs> And all of this before in 2000, Dixon and Joan fulfilled what he says is a long time ambition. They bought a 19 foot, four berth Sundance Swift motorhome. I think it better ambitions. <laughs> Dixon also became the president of Stonehouse Male Voice Choir that year, but the Sundance Swift motorhome was the thing that he wrote first. <laughs> the next year, another long time ambition was fulfilled. David moved out. <laughs> In celebration of their 40th wedding anniversary, Joan and Dixon took their first trip to Ireland with Alec and Morag McEwen. Joan and Dixon both kissed the, kissed the Blarney Stone, and that explains everything. 
In 20, 2006, Joan had finished working and David and Claire were about to be married, so I think probably in an attempt to dodge the wedding planning and possibly fearing the consequences of having to go to visit Ian and Jane, Dixon and Joan moved to Fife. Dixon writes of this momentous year, this is what he wrote. I joined the East Fife Male Voice Choir who meet in Kirkcaldy High School. In September, Joan and I joined Turbane Parish Church, a very friendly church, and we finally travelled to visit Joan's sister in Malawi. We changed our Nissan Primera for a Kia Sportage. <laughs> <coughs> Told you it was a big year. <laughs> well, it's a fight. well, you know. Over the coming years, their three grandchildren, Elizabeth, Jamie and Annabelle, would be joined by three more, Sky and Morgan and Alexander. In 2016, Elizabeth, Jamie and Annabelle were pretty much grown up, so Dixon and Joan decided to move back to Stonehouse to be closer to their three younger grandchildren so they could watch them grow up too and mostly tap their parents on the shoulder and laugh, because <laughs> that's what grandparents do. He was delighted to watch you all grow into the fine young people that you are today. He really was so incredibly proud of all six of you. And in 2022, Dixon and Joan became great grandparents with the arrival of Jacob, something that brought even more joy to their lives. Here in Stonehouse, Dixon again played an active role in the church and he was one of those people I could rely on to be brutally honest about things that he liked and didn't. That involved him almost pinning me up against a wall one Sunday morning <coughs> after I'd arranged a drum to play during communion. Let's just say he didn't like it very much. <coughs> but he told me why. And I understood why he didn't like it. And he understood why I'd done it. And we were best pals ever since. For my part, I absolutely valued his support. I valued his wisdom and that honesty. He was one of those guys who was always there. He would tap you on the shoulder and tell you things were okay, or that they weren't, and you should really do something about that. But he would always have a suggestion. He would never just leave you to it, and he would always help. These are the things that Dixon wrote down about himself. I'm going to ask Ian to come and tell you a bit about what other people think about them too. <laughs> Ian, come and tell us some stories. Do have to stand on this? Oh, you do. Am I going to fall off? No. Okay. I'm actually really far forward. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great to have a big audience here. Um, I would have loved that. Um, okay, so where do you start? And there's so much to say, and what do you include, and what do you omit? So I thought I'd start with a short reading from an Old Testament book, the book of Dixon. Didn't teach you that one at minister school, did they? No. Nope. No, okay. Uh, book of Dixon, chapter 1, verse 52. And the Lord did saith unto Moses, come forth! But he came fifth and he got nothing. <laughs> He was a legend at his own lunchtime. When walking down, see, somebody got it. When walking down the street, wherever you were in Scotland, somebody was bound to know him, and he was bound to know somebody there. Oh, hello, Dixon. How are you doing? How are Joan and the kids? They chat away for a few minutes and then say their goodbyes. Who was that, Dad? I'd say, oh, that's so-and-so. And a name and a background would be added. Although quite often he would reply, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I recognise the face, so I must know them from somewhere. Um, people just knew him. It's also true of David and me. Somehow people know us and their reputations precede us, good or bad. So with that in mind, please don't expect us to know who we are talking to later. <laughs> even if you are family. <laughs> so Dad was well-liked and a well-loved person in the communities that he lived. In the messages received by the family on the lead-up to and following his death, we all heard phrases like, what a lovely man, what a gentleman, what a nice man. And he was. 
We all make an impression on the lives of others, and it's up to us to decide what form that impression will take. Dad's impression on us was clear for all to see, and it wasn't Tommy Cooper. <laughs> Neither was that. For me, Dad was the man I strive to emulate. Kind, tolerant, considered, and respectful of others. Having the ability to see things from a totally different perspective, as hinted upon. And I believe that I also display these traits. Yeah, despite having spent 30 years as a police officer, I have these traits too. I admire the strength of conviction in his faith. And I've had many discussions about religion and faith with Dad. And although I don't relate to any religious faith, and Dad was respectful of that, his strength of conviction is also with me. Dad was the type of person who generally took people at face value and formed his own thoughts. He and I would often share stories about the public we met in a myriad of circumstances during our working lives. Some genuinely decent people, some not so much. I mean, as a local government officer in the housing department, Dad once went to visit a hoarder in a second floor tenement in Glasgow. Our experiences of this type of thing was almost identical. You sometimes had to wipe your feet on the way out. The sole occupant was a bit of a recluse, but would often present himself as a well-dressed and affable man. Complaints had been received from neighbours about the rotting smell and vermin, so he went to investigate. Once inside, there was barely enough space to squeeze through the detritus and piles of newspapers and periodicals stacked floor to ceiling, bearing in mind these ceilings were probably about 12 or 15 feet high. Research, the tenant called it. So how do you deal with that? Social services? House clearance items? Rehousing? No. Dad immediately evacuated the entire building, temporarily rehousing everyone. He called in a structural engineer to survey the place and then removed all the debris. He knew that all that paper stacked up was about four or five tonnes per square metre and would likely compromise the floor structure and cause serious injury or damage. I have too many memories of Dad to share with you right now and I, can, I cannot think of a single negative month. Teaching me how to iron a shirt and trousers. Jimmy. <laughs> Watching wrestling on the world of sport. That was a popular sports television programme for all the younger people. Uh, and emulating that ourselves. Uh, the winner being whoever got the opponent's slippers off and tickled the feet. <laughs> Enjoying bonfire night, then coming home with tingly cold hands to wrap them around a big mug of steaming hot bovro. Building Lego in the middle of the floor and losing the feelings in our legs. Dad took me to a few burn suppers too, where he would be a guest entertainer. The first time I went, we were presented with a bottle of whiskey, gratis. At that time, I wasn't really into whiskey, having had a rather unfortunate vomiting experience a few years earlier at a family New Year party in Wales, but that's a whole different story. However, this bottle on the table did look inviting. It was big, it was round, and it had a big white neck on it with a cork stopper in it. It was Highland Park. I gave it a go. It smelled fragrant. I tentatively took a wee nip, and I enjoyed it. A lot. <laughs> Between us, we emptied the bottle, and I think I drank a wee bit more than he did. Since then, Dad and I have traded whisky experiences and appreciated the finer malts of Scotland, as I do now with my own family. So if you want to buy me a drink later. <laughs> Fittingly, I think, Dad died on the 27th of January, which is the day after the fallout from Burns Night. Sober once more. My overwhelming gratitude to my father is a simple gift of the ability to recognise and appreciate craftsmanship in whichever form it takes. When I was of primary school age, we didn't have much contemporary music around the house until I was gifted a transistor radio. For the younger ones here, ask your parents. <laughs> or grandparents. 
I discovered a world of music was out there and I liked it. I started foot tapping and bouncing about and then ended up in the kitchen table with two knives, tapping away a rhythm, much to the annoyance of mum. Again and again and again. <laughs> it was then I discovered that dad had played drums in a pipe band. Dad got out his sticks and introduced me to the basic rudiments. He lent me a book by legendary jazz drummer Buddy Rich and I was hooked. I got a pair of sticks and a practice pad and started learning in earnest. And I got to be pretty good at the drum kit too. From that point onwards, rhythm made me more admiring of many musical forms from classical to contemporary. And although I may not like aspects of some, I can appreciate the artisanal quality itself. This appreciation of musical craftsmanship now extends to everything. I can see the beauty and form and function of well-designed and constructed items and take pleasure from them. From music to whiskey, buildings and cars. Thanks, Dad. Dixon was inquisitive, probably as a result of his lack of education. He was constantly looking up answers to questions. He was a master of games like Trivial Pursuits. His love of crosswords became legend, and all his knowledge gained could be funneled into solving the cryptic clues. Easy ones can be difficult too, he would say. You know what you know. One across, seven letters. A grandma will often have an alternative instruction. Think about it. I think his day eventually came, became measured by how well he'd done in the Herald crossword. However, the first thing he'd read was always the obituary column. Just to make sure I'm still alive, he'd say. Ultimately, he had a rounded knowledge of most things and was able to answer the most obscure questions and quote unbelievable facts. Dad, what's the longest railway tunnel? Ian, did you know that all the electricity powering the internet weighs the same as an apricot? <laughs> <laughs> Electrons have mass, David, am I right? Yeah, there you go. He did tell me that one, believe it or not. Dad... How many green shield stamps do you need for a glass? <laughs> Kids, you know who to ask for that one. <coughs> he had all the answers except one. How did you know that? And that's another trait I have as well. <laughs> and by the way, the answer to the crossword puzzle is anagram. A grandma, alternative instruction, or an alternative order. It's an anagram of anagram. Dad told me that one. <laughs> He loved a laugh and a joke, sometimes, usually, left mum not a little bemused. <laughs> Family jokes, wordplay, funny stories and poems were a staple of his. He found the self-professed Scotland's worst poet, a man by the name of Walter McCorriskin. However, in my estimation, he was probably one of the best. We both roared with laughter at many poems and observations, including this one, and it's not the one you think. <laughs> I took my dog on the bus one day and it jobbed on the flare. <laughs> and when the clippy saw the mess, he threw a drunk man down the stair. <laughs> Kids, if you don't know what a clippy is, or a, you just ask your parents. He had a talent for writing a parody or a speech for any occasion, and I wish I'd been on hand uh, to help me with this. Perhaps he was. There's been quite a few workplaces so far, subtle or otherwise. As mentioned, he was a great singer from male voice choir and playing with Damon Panto and bath time <laughs> <laughs> to making up a wee Scottish musical skits and performing with friends. The one song which I will always remember Dad by is Two Little Boys, which was made famous by Rolf Harris and incidentally was the last number one hit of the 1960s. And I told Dad that. He didn't know that. He would sing it to me with great passion and drama, so much so that the beautiful dramatic images it conjured up still live with me today. For me, this is a song of hope, family, camaraderie, love and compassion. And all that was Dad. 
Mum and Dad always liked to go off on wee trips around the four nations of the UK. Sometimes by car, sometimes by camper van. Dad would be able to tell you what the four nations of the UK were. Quite often he'd go for a wee trip all by himself, although this was usually brought about by a dodgy paving stone curb or some ice. Mum blamed it on his gait, although that's generally what he'd lean on and get himself back up. <coughs> On one occasion when Dad was flailing around on the ground like a landed fish, a local resident thought he was drunk. He began his falling down career quite young, and it extended well into his octogenarian years. He was even told, by me, that the selectors were looking to recruit him to represent the UK in the tripping up and falling down event for the 2007 Hong Kong Olympics. <coughs> we didn't fall for that one. Dixon liked to have a bit of a laugh though, and recently looking through some of Dad's own research material, uh, I found some marked pages and passages which I'd like to share a couple with you. Uh, these were likely used in some of his little skits, and I know at least one was. Two old men were sitting on a park bench. One said to the other, you know Willie, I've been sitting here that long that my bum's going to sleep. I know, said the other one. I heard it snoring. <laughs> a man goes into a police station. They ask the sergeant, are there any criminal lawyers in this town? Aye, sir, says the sergeant, but we can't prove it. <laughs> and there's no housing shortage these days. That's just put about by people who have nowhere to live. They also had a joyous humour about death. For most people, death comes at the end of their lives. <laughs> Lastly, I'll paraphrase this one. It was found at the notice board of St Ninian's Church. We're sorry to announce that Mr Dixon Gemmell has been quite unwell owing to his recent death. <laughs> <laughs> He's taking a short holiday to recover. <laughs> if only. Dixon was a deeply loved member of the family and community and he who will live on through our hearts and minds. And every now and again, you'll smile and you'll chuckle to yourself and you'll say, that was Dixon. Lastly, I'd like to remind everyone that Dad's favourite dessert was sticky toffee pudding and meringue. <laughs> Come on, you can do better than that. His favourite pudding was sticky toffee put sorry, pudding and meringue. Again, his favourite pudding was sticky toffee pudding and meringue. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, Dad. You were great. Both as my friend and my father. You made a difference and you shall be missed. And it says here, pause for applause. <laughs> It's hereditary. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. God of all grace, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to break the power of death and bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus shared their life took it upon himself to break the chains of death and opened up the kingdom of heaven to all believers. So look not on us, but on us as found in him and bring us safely through the judgment to the joy and peace of your presence. Eternal God, you hold all souls in life. We praise you for all those who have shared this earthly life with us and have entered into eternal life with you. And especially today, we thank you for Dixon for all the things that made him special, for all that you gave him and accomplished in him, all that he meant to those who knew him and loved him. We thank you that for Dixon all pain and suffering is ended, that death itself has been conquered. Help us to release him into your care and keeping and the confidence that all life finds its fulfilment in you and in the joy of your everlasting kingdom. We commend to you those who will miss him the most in the days and weeks to come, 
because they loved him the best. Especially Joan, Ian and Jane, David and Claire, Elizabeth, Ian and Jacob, Jamie and Amanda, Annabelle and Robin, Skye and Morgan and Alexander, and all the members of Dixon's family and all his friends who loved him. Grant that casting every care on you, they may know the consolation of your love. God of all comfort, in the midst of our pain, heal us with your love. In the darkness of our sorrow, shine upon us as the morning star. Awaken us in the spirit of mercy. As we feel the pain of others, we might share with them the comfort that we have received from you. And bring us at the last with all your people into your kingdom, the kingdom of glory, where death itself is ended and every tear is wiped from every eye. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory now and forevermore. Hear us, Lord, as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. You have one last opportunity to sing with gusto. And I genuinely mean it, if you don't, we're stopping and starting again. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Now to the one who can keep you from falling, 
and set you in the presence of his glory. Jubilant above reproach, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord. The peace of God, which is beyond all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. It was Dixon's wish that there would be one final performance, one that he's in. If you listen very closely, stand in third from the right. note said I want that to be played because I'm in it and because the Stonehouse male voice choir always sung it last. That's a jolly way to send people out from a concert isn't it? But he loved it. 
He loved it and he loved all of you. You are invited to join with the family at the Avonbridge Hotel in Hamilton because, believe it or not, there are more stories to tell about Dixon. Many, many more stories and they'd love you to join them to share some of your memories with them. So please do that. But for now, would you please be upstanding as the family take their leave? Thank you.